Please turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10. In the previous <clears throat> chapter of Nehemiah, we saw the people of Judah collectively confessing their sins. And they, they summarized the whole in verse 33 of Nehemiah chapter 9. You, Lord, have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. The people realize that it's their fault that they've been in exile. They realize that it's their fault that they are still in distress, and therefore they are going to try to do something about it. Therefore they are going to make a covenant, and it's that covenant that we will be considering today. And before we read the text, will you please join me in prayer? Our Father, we are gathered here this morning because we believe the truth that we just sang. We believe that there is no greater thing than knowing you. Our heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what we could not earn, the all-surpassing gift of Christ's righteousness. Father, we, we read and we treasure your word. Old and New Testaments. We believe, we know that the Old Covenant points forward to the work of Christ. We believe that this chapter points forward to the work of Christ. Father, protect us from, from the error of seeing your word as a, a list of things we must do. Help us to see Jesus. We ask this by your grace. In that name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 10. Let's begin in Nehemiah 9.38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. On the seals are the names of Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, <coughs> Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malchijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Maluk, Haram, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, Mejamin, Maaziah, Bilgai, Shemaiah, these are the priests. And the Levites, Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Binuai, of the sons of Henadad, Cadmiel, and their brothers, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Kalita, Haliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Heshabiah, Zakur, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Bani, Beninu, the chiefs of the people, Harosh, Pahath Moab, Elo, Zatu, Bani, Bunai, Azgad, Bibai, Adonijah, Bigvai, Aden, Atur, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodiah, Hashem, Bazai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezer, Meshezebel, Zadok, Jedua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Aniah, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashub, Halahesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehum, Heshebna, Masiah, Ahiah, Hanan, Anna, Maluk, Haram, Ba'ana. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, 
that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people, have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God, according to our fathers' houses, at times appointed year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks. And to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God. And to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister, and the gatekeepers, and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. This is the word of our Lord. If you follow professional baseball, um, the last few weeks, especially the last few days have been very exciting. It is, it is opening day. It's the beginning of the season. It's, it's the one day when every team is in first place, at least for one day. Um, Cardinals are no longer in first place. Uh, but the other big news the last several weeks in baseball has, has been player contracts. Uh, if you're a Cardinals fan, you're probably overjoyed to see that Paul Goldschmidt signed a contract to stay with the Cardinals for five years at the low price of $130 million. Um, more widely, even bigger news, uh, Bryce Harper signed a contract with the Philadelphia Phillies to play for them for 13 years and make $330 million. And not to be surpassed by Bryce Harper, Mike Trout signed the largest contract in the history of professional sports, 12 years, for $426,500,000 to play for the Anaheim Angels. While the amounts might, and they do, boggle the imagination, how is playing a game worth $426 million, or even merely $130 million? But the idea of contracts themselves seem very natural to us. Contracts are how our world works. Uh, we, we sign contracts with our employers. We sign contracts with our schools. Um, we purchase houses through contracts and cars through contracts. And we say, you know, I'm going to give this, whether it be this amount of money, um, at this rate over this time, or I'm going to give this amount of effort. I will show up at this time and perform this job. And in exchange, you're going to give me this. Um, whether, again, it might be, I'm going to pay this money, you're going to give me this car. I'm going to work these hours, you're going to pay me this salary. Um, our, our world is, is governed by, really, business relationships. And those relationships are governed by contracts. Um, and when the contract ends, the relationship ends. Right? Once you've finished paying off your house or your car, you no longer have a relationship with the bank or the previous owner 
or the mortgage owner or anybody. It's okay, it's now mine. I have no further obligation to you. I never have to see you again. Um, that's how contracts work. Covenants are, are much more rare in our society today. The word covenant is, is almost an unknown word in our society today. They, they really only exist today in, in church membership and in marriage. And sadly today, many people treat those relationships far more like contracts than like covenants. Uh, a prenuptial agreement is explicitly turning a marriage into a contract. We're going to enter into this relationship, and when one of us decides to leave, this is what's going to happen. A covenant has some similarities to a contract, but it, it's much more important, and it's much more permanent. It's, it's not a business relationship. It's not a financial deal. It is a binding <coughs> promise a pledge to each other. You can't execute a buyout clause from a covenant. You can either be faithful to your covenant or you can be in violation of your covenant. But you can't walk away from the covenant. Once you're in the covenant, you are in the covenant. The word uh, translated as covenant here in, in Nehemiah 9.38, uh, it's not the normal word for covenant in the New Testament, I mean in the Old Testament. Um, it's a slightly different word. It's a word we could translate, the New American Standard um, does translate as an agreement. Say it's an agreement or a pledge, an, an oath, because it's made between men before God rather than a covenant between God and man, like the covenants that, that really control the entire history of the world, the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, covenant with Moses, the covenant with David. This, this is not a covenant like those covenants. It's a covenant between the people of Israel made with, with God. It's a pledge. We are going to do these things. It, it's a covenant in the sense that the founding fathers of the United States made a covenant in the Declaration of Independence after listing their grievances with the King of England, King George. Then they, they declare that you know, we, we therefore are establishing these independent states. They are an independent nation. We have no obligation to the King of England. And, and then the very last line, they say, And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. And they, they stopped it. They, they couldn't walk away from this declaration in, in good faith. They could, okay, well, here's my buyout. Here's a few thousand dollars. And I'm, I'm walking away from this. They, they were in it for life. It's no exit plan. So it is with every covenant. And so it is with this covenant. It's a solemn agreement. The people are saying, not only the, the almost 90 names that begin the chapter, but all the people male and female, native Jew, and, and those who have joined themselves to the people of Israel, they're all solemnly pledging that we will do these things. So first we're going to look at what specifically did they pledge to do? What are the commitments of the covenant? There are three particular commitments that they make. The, the overarching commitment is in verse 29. We are going to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and His rules and His statutes. They're, they're people are making a covenant to keep the covenant. The covenant that God made through Moses. They are going to be faithful to the law. They are going to do everything that the law requires of them. They realize you know, God has been faithful. We have acted wickedly. It's our fault that all these things have happened to us because we haven't kept the covenant. We are going to keep the covenant. So why do they need to go beyond that? Why doesn't Nehemiah chapter 10 just stop after verse 29? Why do you have to say anything more than we are going to do everything that the law requires of us? The same reason why 
so many Christians today ask, what, what do we need a confession of faith for? What do we need a church covenant for? I've already said I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Why do I need to define what I believe? I've already got the Bible. I said I'm going to do everything God requires of me. Why, why do I need to sign this covenant with my church? And the answer for us is the same as the answer for, for these Israelites. Um, the law is long. The Bible is even longer than the law because it includes the entire law. It's very easy for particular requirements to be forgotten or ignored or misinterpreted. I mean, there had never been a point where the nation of Israel formally repudiated the law of Moses. But as we read this morning, as we've read over and over again, as, as we've been going through 1 Kings, I mean, people are constantly violating the law in every way imaginable. So in the areas that we have been particularly unfaithful in, or in the areas that the world around us is particularly challenging us in, we need to be particularly careful to clarify and affirm our commitment to particular things. Um, that's the reason why our covenant, our church covenant, specifically addresses church discipline and, and unregenerate membership is because it has been such a problem in Baptist churches. We made sure that we're going to include those things because we see that as an area in which many Baptist churches have been unfaithful. So the Jews recognize three areas in which they have been particularly unfaithful and they specifically mention them. And the areas of temptation for the Jews are the same areas of temptation for us today. They're not the only ones. Um, but we would do well to strive for faithfulness in these areas, just as the Jews did. The first commitment of the covenant, verse 30, they are going to be faithful in marriage. They are going to be faithful in marriage. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. They are not going to intermarry with the people of the land. It doesn't matter if they are Egyptians or Babylonians or Assyrians or Hittites or Arabs it doesn't matter. They're the people of the land. We will not marry them. Why not? It's not because of some Jewish idea of racial superiority. These aren't Jewish Nazis striving for the master race. It's, remember, even, even as they introduce this covenant, verse 28, um, talks about the rest of the people and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God. It's not about your ethnic group. It's not about your ancestry. In the history of Israel, I mean, in the royal family of Israel, David, King David, was descended from Ruth the Moabite, and he was even descended from Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute. It wasn't about ethnicity. It was a matter of spiritual separation. If the people of the land wanted to separate themselves from their people and come join with the people of Israel, then they were welcome. But the people of God are pledging not to marry people who do not worship God. This is always a particular struggle for the people of God. And I think we can see why. Balaam even encourage the enemies of Israel. I can't curse them for you, but if you just introduce them to the daughters of the land, they'll curse themselves by their faithlessness. There, there's a number, I mean, Israel is a fairly small nation. You have a, a limited number of options to choose from for a spouse. There's a whole lot more people out there. The more people you have to choose from, the better your odds are of finding an attractive wife and an affectionate wife, and some of them are very well connected, you know, if I want to get ahead in life, and helps to marry into a family that's got some money or got some clout, and there's a lot more influential families out there than there are in here. Marrying outside of the people of Israel could, could make life in the land so much better in, in so many ways for the Jews. We, we don't need to worry about 
this people group attacking us if they're all intermarried with us. We're tempted in the same way today. We, we probably don't care quite as much about how well connected this person or that person's family is, but we, we care about just, you know, I love this person and she loves me and what could possibly be wrong with love and, and how could God get in the way of love? How could love possibly be wrong? It, it is wrong for, for one simple reason. That's because no matter how much you might love this person, how much they might love you, there's someone greater than that person, someone who loves you more than that person, someone who deserves your love as well. The people of Israel were warned repeatedly, beginning in, in Exodus 34, verse 12, not to marry the people of the land. And they were given a reason. Because they would lead your hearts away from the Lord. They would lead you to worship other gods. You, it, it's good and it's right for a husband to love his wife. But it is more essential, it's more important that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you're married to a wife or if you're married to a husband who's, who's worshiping another God, it becomes so much more difficult to love God as He deserves. We see an example of this in 1 Kings 11. King Solomon, the, the wisest, the wealthiest, the most powerful of all of Israel's kings. We're told, 1 Kings 11, Now Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after other gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And so often in our society today, we read that, and the immediate thing we go to, and it was a sin and a problem, was 700 plus 300 equals 1,000. He had 1,000 wives. And that was a problem, but that wasn't the biggest problem. The problem was they were from all these nations, and they led his heart away. Um, 1 Kings 11.4, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after. Again, Solomon's great folly was not the number of wives. That was a problem. The far greater problem was that they worshipped other gods. And Solomon loved them. They made him happy. He wanted them to be happy. And for them to be happy, he needed to make allowances for them to worship their gods. And he didn't just allow them to continue worshipping their gods. He built places of worship for them. And the text implies he even, for some of them at least, went and worshipped them himself. This was a very great evil. It brought sorrow to the entire kingdom. It's a reason why there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The nation was split because of intermarriage with foreign wives. And the, the New Testament reaffirms this command. That Christians are not to marry outside the faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and 2 Corinthians 6. I, I can't overstate this Point. It's, it's not possible to exaggerate 
the most important decision you are ever going to make in your life after your decision to either accept the promises of Christ or reject them is who you are going to marry. It matters far more than what school you go to. It matters far more than what career you're going to follow. It matters far more than where you're going to live. It, it matters, matters more than anything. Your spouse is going to have a far greater impact on your faith and your joy than, than any of these things. Proverbs tells us that an excellent life is more precious than jewels. But a quarrelsome wife is like a continual dripping of, of rain. A wife who brings shame is like rottenness in the bones. Your spouse will either encourage or hinder your faith. He or she will, will either help you to follow God or pull you back towards worldliness. If you're not yet married and you're ever desirous of getting married, you need to be careful and discerning in who you are pursuing for marriage. By far the most pressing question you have to ask is, is does this person encourage me to walk with God and reject sin or to walk with sin and reject God? The answer is no, this person doesn't encourage me to follow after God, then, then you need to say no. And no matter how sweet or funny or attractive or, or anything this person is, it, it will ruin your life. If you're already married, you, you don't get to ask the same question of your spouse. It's, I mean, it's tempting. It's easy to, to nitpick your spouse. And it's all their fault for all of my lack of, of spiritual growth. But you can have a covenant. You can't break that covenant. You need to ask a different question. Are, are you an excellent spouse for your partner? Do you encourage your husband to love God more each day? Do you lead your wife to reject the lies of the world and believe the promises of Christ, to find joy and happiness in Christ? Are you leading your spouse's heart from the Lord, or are you leading your spouse to the Lord? You need to ask yourself that. You need to be honest with yourself. And, and if you need to, you need to repent and covenant yourself being a more faithful marriage mate, a blessing rather than a curse to your partner. Again, this, this ban on intermarriage is entirely about faith. And it is desperately important. The second commitment of the covenant, they keep faith in marriage, they would keep faith with the Sabbath. Sabbath rest. Verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So it's commitment to keeping the weekly Sabbath. We, we won't buy or sell these foreigners on the Sabbath. It was the yearly Sabbath. Every seventh year, they were supposed to stop farming the fields and let them rest. And then, I, I don't know that anybody else has ever called it this, but there's a Sabbath of Sabbaths. Um, there's a sabbatical year every seven years you don't farm. And then every 50 years, so after seven sevens, um, there's a jubilee year, supposed to be, in Israel, where you are supposed to free every slave, cancel every debt, and restore everyone's ancestral property. To, to the best of my knowledge, Israel never kept the jubilee year. But that's the exaction of every debt. The problem, people weren't forgiving the debt when they were supposed to be forgiven. They were insisting that every debt had to be repaid to the last penny. It's all, it's, all, it's all bound up with the Sabbath 
rest, to stop working, to stop being concerned about your possessions and your wealth so that you can rest in God. The temptation to violate the Sabbath then as, as now is, is obvious. If, if you're an ancient farmer and your concern mostly is making sure you have enough food to eat, you're going to gather more food if you spend seven days a week gathering than six. If, if you're trying to make money, you're going to make more money working seven days a week than working six. If you're trying to accomplish something important, whatever you define as important, you'll get more done if you work seven days a week rather than six. If, if you're living a life just to have fun and, and be entertained, you can enjoy more stuff if you don't give up one day a week that you could spend doing all this stuff. There's a reason why merchants came to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. There's a reason why so many Christians today treat Sunday just like any other day, as long as you give up a couple hours to go to church. Yeah. By resting from the concerns of the world for, for one day every week, we get less of what the world offers. You don't make up for it by being more productive the other six days. That's not, that's not how it works. Um, if we're motivated primarily by the world and the things of the world, then Sabbath rest is a bad deal. But if we're motivated by a desire for God, then, then it is a great exchange. By stepping back from the world, by stepping back from its cares and concerns and, and distractions, that we are given the time to focus more deeply on God, on, on the excellencies of His character, on the greatness of His works, on, on the vastness of His love for us. It, it's not as, as viscerally exciting as what the world offers, but it is far more deeply rewarding. Now, we, we don't, I don't believe under the New Covenant that, that we need to be as strict as the Pharisees were in keeping the Sabbath, but, but we do need to be sincere. Um, the Pharisees were, were extremely strict. They, they codified everything. You could lift something to weigh this much, but if it weighed any more than that, then well, that became work. You couldn't do it. You could walk this far, but if you took one step further than that, it became work. You couldn't do it. Um, you, you could you couldn't light a fire, even a candle, on the sap. Although Pharisees would allow you to hire a Gentile to light the candles for you, I would imagine you had to pay them on a different day. But you could hire them to do that. Um, I, I'm not sure where this came from, but the Pharisees said you, you could not look into a mirror that was fixed on the wall on the Sabbath. Um, I, I don't think we need to split hairs to that degree. And, and, and if, if something seems necessary on the Sabbath, we have animals to feed people to help and do it. If there's an act of mercy to do on the Sabbath, then, then do it. If we can show love to someone else, then, then do it. But otherwise, our, our mindset should be, if, can this wait? Could I do this on Monday instead of today? Could I do this on Saturday, Friday, instead of today? And, and if I can, then I should. To, to the fullest extent that I'm able to do so, we should let things wait. We should spend as much time as we can just basking in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We should be with the church. We should be with our family in the word, in prayer, in singing, in fellowship. That The Sabbath is not, and it never has been, a burden imposed upon the people of God. It's a precious gift given to us that we might rest, that we might enjoy God.
if, if you're trying to memorize scripture and, and you just feel like you never have the time or the emotional, mental energy during the week to do it, then take this day and set all those other things aside. Now you have time to, to study theology, to, to pray more. The Sabbath gives us that time. Jesus warned in, in the parable of the sower and the seed, Mark chapter 4, that, that there are four types of soil. There's good soil, there's the path, the hard soil, there's rocky soil, and there's the thorny soil. The thorny soil hears the word, it's, it's planted, it grows until the word is choked out by the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. And thus the word proves unfruitful. Sabbath rest is, is pruning back the thorns of the world. They might stop choking us, that we might receive the light of Christ, that we might grow to God and, and be fruitful. And taking that rest. Again, not, it, it's not a rest to just, okay, I have to stop doing all these things and just sit there and be bored for eight hours on Sunday. It's, I'm going to stop doing all these things that I might look to Christ. Taking that rest will be almost as beneficial to your Christian life as having a faithful Christian life. Let's <coughs> So the first commitment will be faithful in marriage. The second will be faithful in the Sabbath. The third commitment of the covenant is we'll be faithful in supporting the ministry of the temple. This is the, the longest section of the covenant because it is, it is the most detailed. They promise they're going to give a third part of a shekel to the service of the house of God every, every year. Uh, they're going to buy lots, provide wood for the temple, have to burn the sacrifices, and they would give the first fruits of basically everything that, that the grow producer are given, and, and the tithes of the field. Um, they, they summarize it in the last sentence, uh, in verse 39. We will not neglect the house of our God. If you read through Kings and Chronicles, seems like the house of God, that the temple has been neglected nearly since it was established by Solomon. Jeroboam led the entire northern kingdom to abandon the temple. He didn't want people going back there to worship, so he set up golden cows at the northern and southern ends of the kingdom. Um, throughout the entire southern kingdom, even though they had the temple, people, whether just out of preference or convenience or whatever reason, many of them would worship at high places, just on, on mountains hills, wherever they could get, rather than going to Jerusalem, to the temple. Hezekiah and Josiah both needed to lead efforts to repair the temple because it had fallen into neglect. And, and the, the reason it's fairly straightforward, it's very similar to why the Sabbath is neglected. Because maintaining the temple, both the, the building and the ministry, it, it takes resources, it takes money, it takes energy, it takes goods. And, and just as there's always something else you could be doing on the Sabbath, there's always something else you could be spending that money on. How, how much easier would it be to buy a new car if you weren't giving money to the church? How much easier would it be to, to buy that very nice house, to, to take those very fun vacations, to, to support these other good causes. There, there's not anything wrong with any of those things, except as they draw us away in the worship of God. That every time you give to the church, every time the Jews gave in support of the temple, you're, you're sacrificing something that you could have gained with that money or that resource. And, and so, just like the Gentiles can make more money or have more fun by working seven days a week instead of six, so can they, by making the same amount of money, they get to enjoy more stuff because they're not giving it to the church or the temple. 
in their eyes, we're, we're wasting money on the church. And it's easy to start asking yourself, is it, is it worth it? Why not leave the support of the temple to others? I need to build my own house. That's why it took the Jews so long to rebuild the temple, because they were all focused on making sure they had nice houses of cedar. I, I need to feed and clothe and educate and, and provide for my own family. I have more important things to do and to spend money on. But a commitment to caring for the service of the temple is a recognition that, that through the temple, the people enjoy the presence of God. And the presence of God is a greater good, a, a higher joy than all the pleasures of this world. Yes, do we similarly value the presence and work of God in the world today? There, there are plenty of things to give your time and energy and money to. Even if you don't want more stuff for yourself, there's, there's tens of thousands of charities that would happily accept your money. But we are convinced that none of these things are as valuable as knowing God and making Him known. Amen. And so we joyfully contribute to the ministry of the church and the spread of the gospel. And the Jews who recognize, yeah, there's, there's nothing as good for us as having the presence of God here among us through the temple. So we, we don't need all these other things if we have God. So they commit to being faithful in marriage. They commit to being faithful in observing the Sabbath. They commit to being faithful in supporting the temple. And those so are the commitments of the covenant. Um, I would like to step back from our text for a few moments and, and consider two more questions more from, from the context of this covenant. First, we need to ask what, what were the causes of the covenant? Why did they make this covenant? We, we saw last time, again, it came at the end of their confession of sin. And in the end of that prayer, we see their specific reason for making the covenant. Uh, Nehemiah 9, verses 32 to 37, sets up the covenant. They, they give three reasons at, at the beginning and at the end of those verses. First, in verse 32, they say, You have dealt faithfully. We have acted wickedly. And then at the end of verse 37, And we are in great distress. There's three causes for the covenant. God is faithful, we are wicked, we are in distress. The Lord, Yahweh, is the God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. We, we even sang it in Psalm 89 this morning. He always upholds His obligations. He never fails in them. We've all failed in, in obligations so many times. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes accidentally. I say, well, of course I will take care of this for you. And then three minutes later, it has entirely escaped my mind. And, and I haven't done it. I have not kept covenant. Sometimes, even worse, I never had any intention of doing it. I just wanted you to leave me alone. So I said I would do it, and I hoped you would forget about it. God never does that. He never fails in His promises. In every covenant He has made, He made a covenant with Adam, he made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with or through Moses with all the people of Israel. He made a covenant with David. He made a new covenant through Jesus Christ. He has kept every last word of every promise. He has dealt faithfully with us. He has dealt faithfully with you according to the promises he has made. We must not doubt God's promises. Because He is faithful, we, we can trust Him in the covenants He has made. The second cause, again, is, is that we and the Israelites have acted wickedly. We, we could go back to Exodus and read the obligations that the people of Israel accepted in the Mosaic Covenant. Obligations they eagerly accepted and, and promised that all that the Lord has said we will do. Even after they were warned by, by Joshua that you're not able to keep the covenant. Their response is, no, Joshua, we will do it. 
You're wrong. We can do this. They've promised to keep the covenant, and they have failed dramatically and repeatedly throughout their entire history. God has kept covenant. Israel has broken covenant and acted wickedly. And, and all of us, you know, even though we as, as Gentiles were not under the Mosaic covenant, as human beings we are under the Adamic covenant. We are under obligation to keep the law of God, the moral law of God, and we haven't. We have acted wickedly. There's, there's a story, it's, it's simplified a little more than it actually was, but uh, there was an English writer named G.K. Chesterton um, who, the story is, there was a, a newspaper seeking essays answering what's wrong with the world today, it's the mid-1900s, and um, Chesterton wrote a letter essentially saying, I am. I'm what's wrong with the world today. The actual letter is a little longer than that. But it's, it's, it's a faithful summary. Said, I am. I am what's wrong with the world today. It's easy to blame those other people over there. These people over here. And society with problems. We, we are wicked. We have acted wickedly. And we'll never get anywhere until we are willing to admit that fact. We have acted wickedly. And because of God's faithfulness, because of our wickedness, we've come to the third reason. We're wicked, therefore we are in great distress. The Israelites had this long history of being oppressed, of being slaves, of being exiles. And even in this return from exile, they're still weak and pitiful and in constant danger from the peoples around them who hate them. In the world today, we can look in any direction and we can see distress. We can see distress racially, socially, economically, politically, nationally, internationally, even environmentally. What do we see in the world around us but the tension and conflict and distress? The state of our world today is not good. Why? It's, it's not God's fault. It's not because He's messing things up. It's because we are acting wickedly. We're bringing these things upon ourselves. And so what's, what's left to us besides trying to stop acting wickedly in, in ourselves? That's our only hope. We're going to pledge to be faithful to the covenant. We're going to actually keep it this time. And that's what leads the Jews to make this covenant. It's their only, what else can they do? God has always been faithful. We can't hope that He's going to change. He's always been perfect. We're the ones who keep messing things up. We need to change. But that leads us to the final area of consideration this morning. It's the catastrophe of this covenant. This covenant, even though it's full of good and right and holy intentions, is an absolute disaster for the people of Israel. It's, it's a catastrophe for get three reasons. First is, is the inability of the people. Do, do you remember how Nehemiah ends? We read through the entire book when, when we started preaching through it. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah has gone back to Persia for a little while. It's back in, in um, Cyrus's, or Artaxerxes' court. Uh, then he returns. And everything is wrong. He goes there and the temple's been defiled. You, you have foreigners who don't worship God living in the temple because they're well connected. You have hordes of merchants coming to Jerusalem every Sabbath buying and selling their goods. You have the people and the priests intermarrying with the people of the land. All three emphasis, emphases of the covenant are broken before we get out of this book. The people can't keep the covenant. This covenant depends upon the, the ability 
of the people who keep the covenant, and they can't do it. Martin Luther once said, um, before he was converted, before he started the, well, he didn't start, before he was used in the Protestant Reformation, he was a monk in a monastery, living a very ascetic and disciplined life. And, and he said that if ever a monk could be saved by their monkery, it was I. Martin Luther spent so much time in the confessional in his monastery that, that the confessor would kick him out. He said, I'm tired of listening to you, Martin. You're in a monastery. You can't be that bad. We are that bad. We, we, on our own, we can't keep any covenant. We can't keep our church covenant. We can't keep God's law. We can't do any of these things on our own. But even if we could, even if you were able, through some rigid self-discipline and external constraints set upon you, even if you were able to keep the covenant, the covenant itself is unable to reconcile you to God. First problem is we are unable, unable. The second problem is the covenant is unable. We, we just read Galatians 3 a few minutes ago. The law is not able to save us. Righteousness is not attainable through the law. God is perfect and God is holy and He requires that we be holy, that we be perfect, that we love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. With all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And our neighbor as ourself. And the law is not able, it's not strong enough to bring us to that point. It can tell us this is what we have to do, but it doesn't give us the ability to do it. Even if we could do it, a present obedience is, is not sufficient to atone for past failures. It's what we saw with Josiah, who did, by the grace of God, turn and follow the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength. But God still did not relent of the disaster he was bringing upon Judah. Now, Augustus Toplady, in this hymn, Rock of Ages, says, Could my zeal no respite no? Could my tears forever flow? Could I spend every moment of the rest of my life repenting of my sins and working for the Lord? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Imagine a man on trial for murder who, who openly said, yeah, I, I murdered this person six years ago, but in the intervening 2,000 days, I have not committed a single crime. I have lived a righteous life. So are you really going to punish me for that one crime committed thousands of days ago when I have so many more days where I've been perfect? Would anybody let a murderer off for that reason? Because they, they only murdered once. And so, well, I haven't murdered anybody. Maybe our sin against man is not as great as murder, but our sin against God certainly is. The law cannot save the covenant, this covenant, no covenant that we can make can make us right before God. But there is one who is able. One who can rescue us from our catastrophe. One who's able both to keep the covenant perfectly and to deliver us from our sinful inability to keep it. The law was but a shadow of the good things to come. It did not have the true form of these realities. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. But God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As we read this 
covenant in Nehemiah that's full of, of good things that people should do. As, as you consider our church covenant hanging on the wall back there, full of good things that we should do, true things that we should do as Christians. We need to avoid falling into the error of, of thinking that if we can just keep the obligations of the covenant, we'll be all right. You can never be saved by your own efforts. You can try as hard as you want. You are not able. The law is not able. But Christ is able and he has done it. Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law of God down to the smallest jot and tittle. He dotted every I. He crossed every T. And he established a new covenant with us. Something so much better than the covenant made through Moses. Better than, than the Mosaic law. Covenant that, that no longer would the law be external to us, but it, he would take it and he would write it on our hearts. And far more importantly than that, he would forgive our sins. He would remember our lawless deeds no more. And He would be our God. And we would be His people. And we would all know Him. From the least of us to the greatest. In establishing this new covenant. It was promised Jeremiah 31. Ezekiel 36. It was established on the cross. Jesus took the sins of all who would believe in Him upon Himself. He was condemned in the flesh so that your sin might be condemned in Him. That you might be set free from sin and found righteous in Christ. He was raised from the dead that He might lead you in triumphant procession into eternal life. You don't have to earn your right standing before God. You can't earn your right standing before God. But Christ has earned it for you. If you'll just take him at his word and trust in what he has done. Amen. Repent of your sins. Repent of your self-effort. And believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. And if you do believe in this gospel, then, then recognize been saved by God that you might glorify Him and enjoy Him forever and we glorify Him through obedience to His word particularly through the proclamation of this message don't go around telling people to be better tell them to believe in Jesus Christ nothing else is required nothing else is Sufficient. Come to Christ. I'm done. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we're only here because of your grace. Most of us because your Holy Spirit has given us life and light. You've called us out of darkness. We had to see the glory of your gospel. Lord, we know there are others here coming only because someone else is bringing them. We all know friends and family and neighbors, co-workers, who are still in darkness. Lord, would you give them the light of your gospel, not because they deserve it, but because you keep covenant and steadfast love. None of us deserve your grace. We're so glad, so grateful that you've given it upon us, given it to us. Help us to treasure your Son, today and every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.